welcome to our Christmas Bird Count for Kids webinar. We had an awesome day today out at Wascana Lake. We had seven groups of people out looking for birds. So before I begin, I just want to, this is a Zoom webinar. So the only people we can see are the panelists and the attendees. We won't be able to see you or hear you. But if you have a question, you can put it into the Q&A. So there is a Q&A button at the bottom. And if you um, would like to ask a question, you can do so there. So before we begin, I would like to just acknowledge that we are on Treaty 4 territory, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. So we respect and honor the treaties and in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration, we are committed to move forward in partnership with Indigenous nations. So today was really great. We were lucky to have uh, some nice weather. And I would like to have our panelists, which is our group leaders, share with us some of the birds we saw and anything interesting you would like to share with the rest of the group. So I'm gonna start with Shirley. Okay, so I was the leader of the Playful Pigeons group and I had a very intrepid group with me. We had lots of kids and um, a few adults and we were moving from the Saskatchewan Science Center around towards Wascana Center and then um, down around closer to the lake. And it was, it was pretty busy out on our trail. We had a lot of skiers and a lot of joggers and we didn't see a lot of birds until the very end. And then thankfully, um, uh, one of our, one of our uh, attendees saw a black capped chickadee and he saw the chickadee and called us all over to it and we were looking and then three others came in. So we had four black capped chickadees kind of on the on the, the last, probably the last eighth of our route. And then when we got back to the science center in the big tall spruce trees that were just outside the center there between the center and the, and the lake, we began to see white winged crossbills. And we started out seeing four and then there were seven. And then as we got closer, we counted a total of 13 with nine males and uh, four females. And those numbers might be a little bit off, but it was definitely 13 white winged crossbills and they were glorious. They were feeding and they were flying between the shrub and the spruce trees and they came really close to us and everyone got a really good view of them. So four black capped chickadees and 13 white winged crossbills. Awesome, that's so great. And I'll get Andy to go next. Okay. Am I muted? You're on. Uh, I'm on. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. I was the leader for the Nutty Nut Hatches. We had, uh, let's see, five kids. I, I think I'm on the kids. We had a, a passel of kids um, and, and five adults. Um, and we started out talking about everybody's favorite birds. I got a lot of really knowledgeable kids. I was really stoked to have uh, kids tell me about the different ducks and woodpeckers and nuthatches and all kinds of you know birds that they they knew. I was really impressed. And I had one penguin. <laughs> um, uh, and and so we we had a, a good walk from. Um, the Wascana Center. We went up Broadway. We started going the wrong direction on the trail. So that was a great observation from the group there that um, health ordinances walk in the right direction. So we did that. Um, in the end, we had, let's see, we had eight black capped chickadees, one downy woodpecker, one American crow, and three magpies. Fantastic. So it was a, a very productive uh, little walk in the in the in the snow up. Thank you, Jordan. Would you like to go next? For sure. So I was the leader of the cheerful chickadees, 
And while we were waiting for all of our group to assemble, the first bird that I saw was a white winged crossbill. That was the only one we saw during the whole time. Uh, we started in the parking lot of the Willow Bar Eatery. And then we walked um, across the bridge over to Pine Island. And we saw like the typical lots of Canada geese. We saw lots of mallard ducks. No wood duck this year though. Uh, lots of pigeons as you could expect. And we also got to see something really cool. We got to see a prairie falcon and it actually was swooping down and chasing the ducks and pigeons while we were on the island. It was super cool to see. Uh, but in total, I, we had five bird species. We had black-billed magpie, Canada goose, uh, pigeons, mallards, and the prairie falcon, and a total of 182 individual birds because there's there was lots of mallards and geese over on the island. They collect around like the little um, open parts of the water. So we got a lot of birds pretty easy. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, my group was the sassy sparrows and we also got to see the, the prairie falcon, which was awesome. That's the first for us. And I'm glad, uh, Mike, you were there because I didn't know what it was. I had never seen a prairie falcon in the winter. So that was really cool. Um, and we also saw some chickadees and we saw some rock pigeons underneath, uh, keeping warm underneath the Willow restaurant. So we had a little shortened route for the, some of the smaller kids. So yeah, it was a good walk. I'm going to uh, promote Rebecca Magnus to go next. Hi there, can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. Um, yes. So at the last minute, there was a change in my group. I was the Sassy Sparrows and then I became the what? Uh, the Rock and Ravens. Right. The Rock and Ravens. And we were rocking. We had two fabulous, fun families, uh, four kids and a total of four adults. Um, and we took on a brand new route this year. So uh, kudos to the kids for the new adventure we took on. And that was around the Connexus Art Center. So we originally set out to take on the full route and quickly realized that there was no way we were going to get through it all in 45 minutes. So we did a slight detour in tour of a smaller circle of the big circle. So we still went around the circle of the Connectors Art Center, but uh, we didn't do the, from street to street to street. So uh, with that though, uh, the we didn't see too much, but what we did see was always fun. Uh, we were first, uh, the the dad of the group was, had the keen eyes to show us uh, the, the Northern Flicker flying by. And then we got to watch for quite a while, two Northern Flickers uh, just chilling out up, up in the, the trees there on, on the east side of, of the Connexus Art Center there parking lot. And then, uh, and then we really tried. We saw some really great, lots of uh, other wildlife evidence of rabbits and, and squirrels around, lots of nests and lots of food being moved around. And then right at the end there, we saw uh, and it was very tame. We probably could have come within a couple of feet if we were tall enough, but uh, a downy woodpecker was just feeding away, having a frenzy along the tree row. So it was great. We had a great time and, and I thank my two families for, for their enthusiasm. And, uh, and we even snuck in a little tree climbing along the way. So it was great. Awesome. And Jim Elliott, he was the leader of the Darling Downy Woodpecker Woodpeckers. Um, they were around the, the ledge and down the trail, and they had quite a few species, the magpie, chickadee, rock pigeon, red-breasted nuthatch, saw a raven and a fox squirrel and a jackrabbit. So that was pretty good. And now, Elaine, I'm going to promote you so you can talk about your group. Hi, we had two families. Um, and uh, both 
both, both with sets of boys. So it was great for, for boys and they were very knowledgeable. So it was um, really good. One of the boys was really excited that it was the first time that um, we saw a crossbill, um, a white wing crossbill. So, so we saw um, seven different species. We saw eight of the, no, sorry, five of the crossbills. Uh, we saw eight house sparrows, we saw a raven and five rock pigeons, we saw eight um, black cat chickadees, one uh, red-breasted nuthatch, and um, one hairy woodpecker. Um, so it was, it was a toss-up between um, whether or not it was a hairy or downy, but um, the consensus was it was a hairy. And I just wanted to thank um, 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 Wayne Koenig, who's a member of Nature Regina, and he keeps the feeders uh, full all year long at the Native Plant Garden, because we started out at the museum and looped around by um, Speaker's Corner and back around by the old pool, and we ended up back at the Native Plant Garden, and that's where we saw up close uh, several chickadees and nut hatches. So it was really cool in there, and the house sparrows, of course, were hiding around in there too, so yeah, it was great. We had a good time. That's awesome. So in total, uh, between the seven groups, we had a total of 14 different species and 280 individuals. So pretty good for the winter. Good job, you guys. So I'd like to do a poll, a couple polls here. So you're going to see a question come up on your screen, and I would like you to answer it. Okay, answers are coming in. Okay, so it looks like 78% of you have come to the, the bird counts before. So that's awesome. So 22% were, were new. So that's so great to, there we can see the results. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, and we'll do another one here. What is your favorite bird you saw today? Maybe it won't even be on this list, but pick your favorite. Okay. Okay, it looks like majority of you guys like the black cap chickadee, which I love too. They're awesome. They're so adorable. Okay, I have one more poll. Did you see a bird today that you have never seen before? Yeah, that was so awesome seeing that prairie falcon. That was a one, new one for me. So some of you had, some of you didn't. So thank you guys so much for participating. Oh, the raven wasn't on the list. Yeah, that was an awesome one too. I love the raven as well. They are so smart. They have their own unique language. Yeah, they're awesome. That, that's Parker's favorite bird. Okay, if there's no more questions, I think we're going to hand it over to Living Sky Wildlife Rehab. Jan, are you still there? We, we see your friend.
probably far more interesting and photogenic than I would be sitting there as a panelist. <laughs> she's um, <clears throat> she's not used to having a computer in her room, so she was um, pretty startled at this, you know, little silver box that had a bunch of voices coming out of it. Uh, but uh, she is a, she's a red tail hawk that has been with us for a while. Um, we've been working with a falconer and flying her since August. Um, her flight was okay, but really not good enough to release her with the anticipation that migration was coming soon, um, uh, which is what we were hoping that she would be strong enough to be able to go. It's taken a couple of years practically, um, or at least it feels like that, for her feathers to grow back in. She came into us um, with a bunch of broken feathers and, um, and potentially an injured wing. The injured wing healed rather quickly, um, but the feathers, because hawks don't mold all of their feathers at once. Um, they tend, because they have to fly for a living, and, uh, and so they will mold sort of one or two feathers on each side so that they're equal. Um, and uh, so they'll lose one or two at a time. And so it takes a really long time to replace something like 18 different feathers on each side. Um, so, uh, so she has been hanging out with us for a while and, uh, and so we're hoping that, uh, with her, some of her falconry training now, um, that we'll be able to fly her a little bit more consistently in the spring, get her up to snuffy and, uh, and let her go back into the wild in the summer. That's the plan for her. Yes. Um, so my name is Jan Shattuck, uh, the human, um, and I'm the executive director for Living Sky Wildlife Rehabilitation here in Saskatoon. Basically, we take in injured and orphaned wildlife, fix them up, and put them back into the wild. We, and that's our goal. Our goal is not to keep these birds or these mammals. Um, our goal is to put them back into the wild where they belong. Um, this year, um, well, pardon me, it's the new year now. So last year, 2020, was an insanely um, busy year. We ended up taking in um, 1,979 animals in total, um, which is uh, a huge number, almost 2,000 animals. Um, last year, we took in almost 1,300. So pretty much 150% of last year. So I don't know if that is because people were home and because of COVID outside and enjoying nature more, which is a fabulous thing, and finding the inter-orphaned wildlife and bringing them into us. Um, I don't know. Um, we're very lucky. You have um, a rehabilitator down there in Regina as well that um, does a fantastic job. That's Megan Lawrence at Salt Haven West. Um, and we have a few others around the province in Battleford, um, down in Silverwood um, Municipality. Um, Moose Jaw still has Melanie, um, and um, Mark is out in um, Meadow Lake area, um, and we're all generalists, and then there are some specialists. So we have a bat specialist here in Saskatoon, um, which is definitely a specialty, and, uh, and a raccoon specialist, and hopefully we get a fawn specialist, so it will be good. Um, I thought I would do a brief presentation, and, um, and then if there's any Q&A or questions, anything that people really want to know, um, we can do that. And, uh, and so then after the Q&A, I can go sit in the songbird room. And again, those are going to be a whole bunch of songbirds that came in. Unfortunately, very often in the fall, birds have a tendency, they're migrating out of the boreal forest and heading south. And they've lived up in the woods and they're little backwoods hicks and they don't know anything about glass and cats and cars and fences. And they fly into windows and they get caught and they get injured. And so they, get, they come to us and we do our best. Um, sometimes their injuries take a little bit too long and they are, again, just like her, they, sorry, um, they aren't ready for migration. And so then they're stuck overwintering with us. Um, and so they spend their, their winter with us hanging out in another room. We obviously don't put the hawks and the songbirds together. Um, so I will um, open up a really short version of a PowerPoint um, that nobody really wants to probably have to see, but PowerPoint is a lovely thing and it shows pictures and hopefully it's a good thing. So you said I could share my screen, right?
yeah, yeah. that's enabled yep. okay. be able to, yeah all righty let's see if i can do this i'm gonna go with share oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing <laughs> oh here we are okay i enabled you got it, it. <laughs> that's fantastic i'll do this one okay not sure what she's doing, but she's in the background. Okay, all right, everybody can see that screen, hopefully. Since I can't see or hear any of the participants, we'll just roll with it. Um, so because wildlife rehabilitation is fairly new, believe it or not, in Saskatchewan, um, they first started giving out permits in 2005. Not everybody necessarily knows what wildlife rehabilitation is, um, but it, the, again, the short version is we take in um, injured animals and we fix them up and we put them back in the wild. We've been do I've been doing this since um, 2005 when I got my first permit, and by 2010, we had so many animals rolling through that we thought maybe we should probably create an organization and get some funding um, for it. And, uh, and so we created Living Sky Wildlife Rehabilitation. Um, and the Living Sky is partially because we are in the land of Living Skies in Saskatchewan, and partially because most of the animals that we get in are actually birds. And, uh, and birds um, definitely make the skies alive. And, uh, and I would like it to stay that way. And um, unfortunately, we've been losing a lot of our songbird populations over the last decade. And uh, so, um, wildlife rehabilitation and our ability to put animals back into the wild um, is quite a, quite a benefit. Um, hopefully we're making a little bit of a difference in terms of population and just attention to some of the things that can um, impact the different bird species. This year we took in 114 different bird species. Um, that's a lot of species. Uh, so we take in the little birds, we take in the orphaned mammals, we also take in injured animals. Um, and the, again, the goal is to put them back in the wild. We don't keep them as pets. Um, we do sometimes have education animals, and those are creatures that have come into care that can't be returned back to the wild, but they aren't injured in such a way that they will continue to suffer through the rest of their life. We don't keep anybody who's suffering. Um, and so we had a couple of 13-line um, ground squirrels that were our educational ambassadors, and uh, they usually live to be about three years old, and um, unfortunately, we, we lost both of them this year. Um, and uh, they were in there, they were five. So um, my little old lady, I always like to say, was about 105 in human years. Uh, but they did a fantastic job of really teaching kids the importance of even some of those really small creatures um, that have a job to do. And, and, uh, and we need to respect that and appreciate that. Um, so a lot of people do think that ground squirrels, aka gophers, um, are annoying or raccoons. Um, we were actually out on the Pike Lake bird count and you guys got some really cool birds, I might add. Um, we did not get a prairie falcon. Um, I was just delighted to get a red-breasted nuthatch, to be perfectly honest with you. We had so many chickadees and a few ravens and a few magpies, but um, you guys got some really cool birds. No ducks, no geese on our um, I'm very jealous. No flickers. I was so jealous of the flickers. Anyways, I digress. Um, but lots of people, and even today I heard somebody saying, you know, really complaining about the magpies. And, um, and lots of farmers shoot ravens and crows and magpies. And, um, but they have a job and they're valuable. And these little raccoons, they have a job. They're very valuable to the environment. Um, and so we have lots of reasons to do this. These, this particular slide are reasons that people give us why we shouldn't do it. But I happen to think, obviously, that we should. Um, the majority of the animals that we see see come in because of, of something that has happened to them um, that is related to humans. Sometimes people bring them in and they say, oh, this crow is trying to eat this little, you know, this little bird or this little bunny. 
Um, and then we kind of, you know, scratch our heads and say, oh, okay, that was really too bad that you picked it up because it was probably, you know, their lunch or their supper. Um, but we rehabilitate the animals and appreciate that, um, that the human that brought them in um, valued that little animal enough that they didn't want it to get injured and hurt. Um, and hopefully the crow or the raven or whatever was trying to eat it will find something else to eat. Um, and that is one of the harsh realities of, uh, um, of actually, if you're not a vegetarian, you probably eat chicken or cow or, you know, pig. Um, and things in terms of us, we hear so many different animals um, in the process of just our own human um, living and being. Um, so it's the process of caring so it can be released back into the wild. And the amazing thing is that every 114 of those species that we cared for this year needed something different. The house sparrow needs something different than the chickadee then the red-breasted nuthatch and most definitely different than the crow. Um, and so everything is a little bit different. So we have to identify the birds um, and then we have to figure out what exactly is wrong with them. Are they just orphaned like these cute little barn swallows? Are they injured like this kingbird? Um, or are they sometimes maybe just a little bit lost or thin or something like that? But every, every animal is a little bit different. Um, that nice little redhead was really happy to leave. She could not fly out of that kennel fast enough. Um, and so we work really hard. Our summer is our busiest season. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually one of those weird people. I don't really like the snow and the cold, but I like the winter because I get to sleep. In the summertime, we're running 16 hours a day and, and there's just no time for, for even breathing. Um, and so winter is sort of my time to be a bit of a bear and, um, and hibernate and sleep and catch up on paperwork. Um, so when we treat and when people call us and say, there's an injured such and such, I always walk through a series of questions with them. Is it a young one? Is it an adult? Adult wild animals, we need to be very careful because they are used to being independent and wild, like this lovely red tail behind me who is looking down on me. You can't see this, but with the great indignity that she has as she's looking down at me. Um, and uh, and just she just she can't believe that I'm sitting on her floor talking to this computer. Oh. And <laughs> she's very upset with me. Um, so adults don't necessarily do really well in care because they get so stressed out. And so we need to be careful to make sure that we're going to be able to fix the injury and make it worth it. Um, otherwise, there's it's an amazing thing, but we have in Saskatoon, and I'm sure you must have in Regina, um, animals with what I would consider disabilities that have been successful. So we have a deer here on the west side, um, and she has three legs, and she's had three legs for a long time, and she continues to have fawns every year and do fine. And so it's great. We get these calls from these concerned citizens, and I'm able to say, oh, is that that one over on the west side on 11th Street? And they go, yes. And I go, great. She has babies. She's been doing fantastically. There's no Disabilities Act for wildlife, but this animal has been doing amazingly well and doing great and we are so not gonna interfere with that. Um, there was a fox this year who had, holy Hannah, I think like seven kits or something in Saskatoon and she injured her paw, but we were able to observe her and see that she was still hunting and bringing food back for her young. And also because both parents help out with the fox kits, um, dad was also bringing food back for the babies. And uh, so there was no way we were gonna take that mother out of the wild, stress her out to try and fix her paw. I know that it was painful for her, but she was an amazing little animal and she made it through. And uh, within about a month or so, she was walking much better. And by the end of summer, um, she was okay. So uh, we have to make some of these interesting choices about whether we can catch them or whether it's worth it to them. All of this is done by people who care. Um, obviously, we don't do this because we don't like wildlife. We do it because we love them. 
Um, they don't have owners, and so we take them to the veterinarians, and uh, and we have veterinarians, thankfully, that do a lot of the work for us at cost. Um, otherwise, if you can imagine, when you have a dog or a cat and it has an emergency and you rent it into the vet, it's very expensive. So. Um, we care enough to be able to do some of this and thankfully that we have vets who do as well. This is a little fox kit. Um, there's somebody shot the mother and I don't know if it was them or somebody else that went back a day or so later and this little baby was still with its mom. Um, but the, the bullet had grazed its head so it was probably under the mom when, it, when the mom got shot. Um, and it turned out fine but um, it, at the time that it came in it was really hungry. Your role in helping wildlife is to help us figure out how to keep it wild. And so if that is a baby that needs to come in and we raise it, um, or if that is an adult and we just monitor it and support it out in the wild, that, that's your job is to identify it, to see it, to find it, and to call us um, and find out what exactly you should do. Because in different circumstances, sometimes the answer is do nothing. So again, if it's an adult that we think will make a recovery, we leave it alone and we just support it and monitor it. In this particular case, mom in the natural history of things tends to leave her babies because they're, they're, they can't keep up with her. And so she'll say, you guys just stay right here, hide in the bushes, don't move, and I'll be back for you in a little bit. There's oftentimes no babysitters, I'm afraid, in the wild. And so mom puts her in a, what she thinks is a safe place and people find these little babies, whether it's a hare or a fawn, and they think that, they're, that the babies have been abandoned. And so it's really important sometimes before um, you, you do anything is understand and know what that animal's natural history is. If the natural history is that mom is going to leave them for long periods of time in a safe place, then let's not disturb them. But just again, just sort of monitor from a distance and nine times out of 10, if not more often than that, mom comes back for those little babies and you go check on them in a few hours and the baby's long gone because mom has come back and taken her. So we need to make sure that we don't interfere with some of these little guys. If it is clearly injured and it's something that we can probably do something about, then you can call either Living Sky Wildlife Rehabilitation in Saskatoon. If you're outside of Saskatoon, you can call the Provincial Wildlife Hotline. So this is a young fawn who's injured. And so the combination of being injured and young means that we may very well be able to help that little animal. Cats are amazing. I love my two cats. I do not let them outside. Um, we were birding today and it was appalling. Um, and this is just me being honest. Um, there was all these, there were like at least 10 feeders and there were birds everywhere. And as I was looking, I was scanning with my binoculars and I saw a cat sitting in the tree, like a foot from the feeder. It was like, why do you have your cat out if you're going to have 10 bird feeders? What am I missing? Um, and of course, at some point, the cat sort of jumped. And thankfully, I didn't see it. It didn't catch anything. But if you're going to feed birds and invite those little guys into your yard, honestly, let's try keeping the cats inside, at least in the spring and summer. But in the wintertime, the birds are also struggling and they're coming to your feeders because there's not a lot of food out there. And so you're creating a bonanza buffet for the birds, but unfortunately the predators are coming in as well. The natural predators, I understand because the shark shin hawks and the coopers that stick around all winter, they come and eat off of my bonanza buffet. They get all up some of my house sparrows. Um, that's nature. My cat is not part of nature. And so unfortunately when they catch animals, um, they can cause some real problems. They're full of bacteria and we have to get that animal on antibiotics pretty quick. Baby bird fell out of the nest. Now what do I do? Well, if you call us, we can walk you through what to do. If it's a little naked thing like this, you want to kind of keep it warm. Maybe if you can, put it back in the nest. Um, otherwise, bring it in to us or to a local wildlife rehabilitator who can raise it on the right food and, uh, and, and, and put it back into the wild once it grows up. 
windows are a huge issue. Um, how many, well, I can't even ask because because I can't see the, the participants, unfortunately. Um, but uh, windows are a huge issue. So we have a big initiative called Birds and Windows or Birds in Real Danger. And uh, so there's, there's again, in the fall, these little birds fly out of the, the boreal forest. They run into windows. They run into cats and dogs. Huge issue. We really, really, really would like to put ourselves out of a job um, by fixing all the windows in the country um, and putting dots on them or putting something on them. Because if I was a bird, I would be looking at this and thinking it was a tree and trying to fly into the tree and smashing my head and it would hurt. And um, when they are flying really fast, um, unfortunately, sometimes they just die right there. They just brain hemorrhage and die, um, or they sit on the ground as this one is doing. And what unfortunately can happen is that then, if not your cat, but a local cat or crow or some other predator comes along and gets this little bird while it's sitting on the ground with a concussion trying to recuperate. So we definitely say, go outside. If you see a smudge, if you hear a thump, look down below for the bird, try and find it, put it into a box with some holes or not, and, um, and just keep it in a quiet, dark place, check back and see how it's doing, call us, bring it in. Um, we can get it on some pain medication, some anti-inflammatories. Um, really, really important to try and protect these birds. There are hundreds. We had um, we had well over 300, about 350 birds that came in, and we are one center in one fairly small city in Canada. So can you imagine how many thousands are coming in to some place like Toronto, where they have the Fatal Light Awareness Program? Um, it's a huge thing. So if it's young, we have to ask if it's really orphaned, or is it like this little bunny that is really cute and looks like it might be orphaned, but it's not, or the raccoon that actually is very orphaned. Um, and if it's injured, can we help? Um, do, you know, can we fix it? Can, can we be helpful? Um, or is it just going to stress the animal out to the point that it's never going to heal? So clearly this deer is hopping along on three legs and doing fantastically. So what can we do? How can we best help? Because our goal is to keep wildlife wild. That is our goal. We want to put these birds and animals back in the wild. You can help, you can donate time, volunteer with your local wildlife rehabilitator, help pick up animals that are already in boxes. Um, if you have the funding ability, if you have the funding, if you have more money than time, great. We would be happy um, to be able to put that money to good use. Most all of us are really, um, no, we're not funded by governments and um, we run off of volunteers. And so if you donated $10 that would probably go $50 worth because we stretch those pennies pretty quick, um, pretty well. Um, do things, if you happen to have spare things hanging around, um, we can always use these sorts of things that get used up on a regular basis. Um, and the, the last thing, which is really easy and cheap, is get the word out about living in harmony with our wild neighbors. Um, convince other children to not um, hurt the wildlife. Don't play with it. Don't shoot it. Don't touch it. Call if you have questions or concerns. Um, and recognize that even if an animal is annoying you, that you you really, it's not about shooting them and getting rid of them. It's about figuring out how we live with them. Um, if you are a young person in school, I can, well, when you're actually in the classroom, I can almost guarantee you that you probably have kids in your classroom that annoy the snot out of you. And you're not allowed to shoot them. You have to figure out how to get along with them, right? Teachers are always saying, let's figure out how to get along with everybody. So when the deer are eating your garden, figure out what you need to do to get along with them. You know, when the foxes are eating your chickens, maybe you need a better fence um, and rather than shooting the fox. Um, so when the beavers are flooding the roads, we need to figure out how to put better culverts through so that we can live in harmony with our neighbors rather than trying to get rid of them. I'm sure we all have people that we'd like to get rid of, but we aren't allowed to. So um, you guys can't actually ask any, well, I guess you could ask questions in the chat. Um, yeah. Give me your thoughts, comments, questions, um, or I put you to sleep. <laughs> thank you, Jan, so much. And thank you for the work you do. If there are people that would like to ask a question, 
um, and would like to show your video, I can promote you to a panelist and then we can see you and you can ask Jan directly your question or you can ask it in the Q&A box down below. There's a Q&A button there. You can ask your, your question in that, in that box there. So just let me know, put a, put a, tell me you would like to ask a question in the question box and then I can promote you. Okay, so Shannon Thank has you, a question. Shirley, you uh, she says, how do you make sure that they stay wild? You know, that's, an, um, that's a really good question. It's from Grant. Um, because when they're babies, hmm? Uh, when they're babies, um, we have to actually love them and nurture them. And so we have to feed, well, the baby birds we're actually feeding every half an hour. Um, and the mammals I'm feeding every four hours through the night. So I have a little, you know, sort of baby brain syndrome in the spring. And, um, and so I have to love them and nurture them and, um, and give them that stimulation that they need as a baby. <clears throat> and then, and so the risk is, is if we have one of something that they get very bonded to us. Um, and so we actually, as rehabilitators, we work with each other so that we always try and have two. Um, so that that physical stimulation and connection to another being can happen with its own species. And so if I have one fox, I work really hard to love it and nurture it. But as soon as I have two, I let them do the work together rather than me although I still have to feed them. <coughs> but we have to actually be very careful because they are adorable. And, uh, and so we have to be really careful not to sort of over love them um, because they're not our pets and we have to let them be wild. And so at a certain point, um, we put them away from us and we put them out in, out in um, what I call pre-release pens where they really don't see humans at all. And, uh, and they have a chance to what we call wild out. And the same thing for the birds. The birds we're feeding every half an hour. Um, they tend to do better than mammals at wilding up though. So yeah, good, very good question. Uh, Linda, <coughs> you had raised your hand. You would like to ask a question. I can uh, promote you so you can ask it live. I'll just do that right now. I have a question. It's, uh, can I have to write the like the thing phone number so I can write it down and then I can know what to call and then I'll put it in safe place. So when I need it, I'll just take it out and tell my parents to call the number. Perfect. Are you in Regina? I'm guessing. Regina. Yes. Okay. Then I'm going to give you the provincial hotline number, and that is 306. Yeah, I have that already. Perfect. 242 7177. Okay. Perfect. Good. Good question. Okay. Is there any more questions? Do you guys want to see some songbirds? I yeah. Let me stop my video for a minute and then I'll move. I will walk into the songbird room. So we have a rose-breasted grosbeak. We have a robin. We have. We actually have. I think a warbler if not a yellow warbler we might have a yellow rumped warbler and we have a flicker oh they're going to be very upset with me <laughs> and i have two crossbills i have a red crossbill and i have a white wing crossbill all right So as you can see, we use lots of the Christmas greenery um, from little trees to the boughs of greenery. And so <laughs> they're like, why is she in here? Um, and so they are flying around and hiding in the greenery and chirping. They're not gonna let me get super close, but I can see we have a purple Martin. We have a couple of house sparrows. 
I have a white-throated sparrow. I think that was the one that may have hit at the airport. The airport in Saskatoon this past fall was particularly deadly. Um, I, I, one day I, uh, I got a call that there were so many dead birds and uh, I went up there and in an hour and a half, I picked up um, 79 birds. Um, and I think a little over half of them were already dead. And, uh, and the other ones, thankfully, um, were able to be recuperated and, and released. But uh, it was an insane day and it continued throughout the day. So that hour and a half um, was really sort of the tip of the iceberg. Um, over here on this bow, I don't know if you can see her, is a thrush. I think she's a Swainson's thrush. I have no idea how to zoom my computer camera. There she goes. Yeah, oh, they're all up on the window. You guys probably can't see them. But uh, this is our songbird room. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Oof, there goes the flicker. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of little birds up here. Oh, now they're all going to go. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm very, very much upset them. Oh, there's the flicker. You can see that in silhouette. Yeah, it, it's a pretty busy room. We are fairly careful not to stress them out too much. The purple martin, which would normally actually be catching, um, that's the little guy on top of the, the wooden structure there. Um, he would normally be catching um, flies in the air. And so we have to, in the fall, when we know that the purple martin isn't going to be able to migrate, um, we have to train him to, uh, to eat out of a dish because otherwise he would only eat on the wing. And, uh, and so we, we spend several weeks <clears throat> ensuring that he figures out sort of how to land on the dish and eat um, because as a swallow species um, or flycatcher type species, they, they, they eat on the wing. And so they don't normally um, eat out of a dish. And so it's, a, it's always a process. And there's our little Robin trying desperately to hide from me. There she is, um, flying around, walking around on the back up there. So. Jan, we have another question. So that's a whole bunch of it. Yes, ma'am. So how many injured birds at the airport during the pandemic? Is that normal to have that many injured or deaths? I don't think the pandemic had anything to do with the injuries. I don't know if it's normal or not. I think that's an excellent question. I've been wondering that myself because if that is, if that is something that is normal and has been happening for a while and we're just finding out about it, I don't even want to think about how many birds have died. Um, I, I'm hoping that it was a bit of an anomaly. Uh, I went up every day after that for the next two weeks, um, two or three weeks, um, and, uh, and they had, uh, they continued to have birds for me. Um, mostly dead, but while I, I would just, I would stay there for about an hour, hour and a half and, uh, and, and get birds. We did after a couple of days, the numbers went down because we convinced the, the, the airport to put streamers up on the windows. And so the streamers blow in the wind in front of the windows. And, um, and so then it breaks up that reflection and the birds see, um, see, saw the glass and sort of recognized it. We still got strikes, but not like a hundred a day. Um, it was closer to like 25 or something that I would pick up every day. And then the numbers slowly dwindled as our migration season went down, right? I mean, this was at the end of um, September. And so I, I can't even imagine how many were hitting the windows earlier in September and all through September. And so um, ideally, the, the, the airport would be putting up permanent um, silhouettes or 
dots or something on the window to, to prevent this, they may end up just doing the streamers. Because of the pandemic, the airport is having some financial struggles like the rest of the universe is having because of COVID and, uh, and stuff. And so they may have to put off the, the permanent answers for a little while. But um, I was really pleased that they took the steps that they did. It was a Monday that I went and picked up all these, these birds. And by Wednesday, uh, midday, they had gotten up the streamers. And, uh, and that significantly reduced um, the bird strikes. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know if it's just because the Saskatoon airport was maybe renovated a few years ago and the amount of glass was increased um, or if it was just, yeah, I don't know exactly why so many um, happened. Wow. Yeah, it was a little crazy. Yeah. Uh, Lynn, do you have another question? You can ask your question. It's like how uh, most goosey fly fly north, Smoke. south to for the winter, but they're still here. So will they survive or what? Good question. The um, most birds fly south for the winter um, for a couple of different reasons. And um, one is if they don't have the ability to survive in the cold, they have to get out of here. And the second piece is, um, and it kind of it kind of links to that survival thing, is if their food disappears. So one of the things that we have in Saskatchewan um, are mosquitoes and flies and a whole bunch of insects um, in the summertime. We don't have any of that in the winter. So if you're an insect eating bird, you're, you kind of go hungry in the winter time. And if you go hungry in the winter time when it's that cold, you're gonna starve to death. And so the important thing is that you get food, which means you need to go south far enough and to be able to find bugs. And so a lot of the birds migrate because they have to eat bugs. And so they have to go south and find the bugs and get their food. There are some birds here that some, most of them migrate because it's, easy, it's easier. Um, it's easier for them to fly that far because it's easier to find food once you get there. Um, the other ones sort of, it's a trade-off. Rather than putting in the time and energy to fly, they choose to stay. And so it's harder to stay and find food, but you don't have that long journey to make. And so we have a couple of flickers that tend to stay here. Um, I, I mean, I say a couple, but a few. Um, most of the flickers disappear. And the same is true for the robins. Um, there's always a few robins that tend to stay here in the wintertime. Um, you guys had crows, actually, I heard on your vagina count. Um, they are also usually, you know, further south. Again, there's a few that tend to stay. I know we have two in our neighborhood. Um, and it's interesting because I think one of them, because they, they made up for life. And I think one of the, the pair here in, in our neighborhood is injured because I see him walking all the time in his territory in the summertime. And, uh, and so I think one is injured and can't fly really well. And so the mate stays back with him. Um, so yeah, for a lot of species, um, most of them fly south, but there is a few that tend to stick around. Did that answer your question? And yes, they should survive. Yeah, yeah and Regina is- Thank you. Little... You're welcome. Because we have, we have open Regina water on, on Los Ana Lake. So that so it's good they're, they're finding yeah. food under the under the water so they, they're able to survive and that's why they probably choose to stay here rather than making that long journey so well thank yes. you so much and ducks and geese are good thank you yeah this i was, was just so gonna great. say ducks and geese are actually really kind of they're super cool because like to me I, my feet would freeze if i was down there in the water in that icy cold water Ducks and geese are really cool. They have this special blood system where the blood that's going down that's nice and warm is cooled off by the blood that's going up. So when they get down to the feet, they don't lose any heat. And so they can actually sit on the ice like they do and not freeze their feet. It's pretty cool. 
they're, they're, the adaptations that wildlife have um, to be able to survive our winters is amazing. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We learn a lot. Good. Great. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you for having us. This was so great. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for our volunteers that led groups today. I would like to thank Nature Regina for their contribution to this event and to Nature Canada. They provide us funding so that we can put on events like this. So please follow us on social media. I'm, I'm gonna post this presentation on our YouTube channel so you can watch it again and other people can enjoy it. Um, and thank you so much for joining us.